and welcome back. In this video, you and I get to chat about IAC, Infrastructure as Code. And as an example, let's imagine we have a network over here. I'll draw it as a cloud. And we are going to roll out a new site. So we're going to have at the edge, very likely some type of a firewall that is connected to the internet. In that firewall, we may have a demilitarized zone and some interfaces that go to our internal network. And let's also go ahead and put a load balancer right here. We'll talk about that in greater detail here in just a moment. And then internally, it's very likely we're going to have some multi-layer switches. We'll call this SW1. And that may have routing capabilities in it with switch virtual interfaces. So maybe we're supporting VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 and VLAN 30 and providing all the routing and security between them. And from our zone perspective, this could be our inside zone. And for interfaces that lead off to the public internet, that could be called the outside zone. And where our public services are, that could all be the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. And then we can set up our security policies on the firewall to specify what traffic should be allowed or denied or inspected or translated, etc. So in DNS, if we set up our servers, let's call that server one srv1.ourcompany.com and srv2 at ourcompany.com. So when a customer out here on the internet wants to go to a server, they would ask DNS and say, hey, I need the IP address, for example, of server1.ourcompany.com. In the background, there'd be a DNS response. And oftentimes what's going to happen is that DNS response is going to point not to an IP address that leads to one of the servers, but actually a virtual IP address that leads to a load balancer. And so let's imagine that load balancer, the global address is 23.1.2.9. So I'm just making that IP address up on the fly here. That's a, a routable public IP address. So when the customer is forwarding traffic towards that IP address, what happens is that actually goes to a virtual IP address that the load balancer is supporting. Then the load balancer can take a look at the request coming in, and then based on a variety of things, including what type of browser is being used or how busy the servers are, the load balancer can then forward that request to the appropriate server. So maybe both of these servers have the exact same content on them. So the load balancer can be keeping track of these two servers, which one's the most busy, et cetera, and then forward the request to the appropriate server. So from the customer's perspective, they don't know. They just went to a website, they got a response, and they didn't realize that behind the scenes, it went to a virtual IP address, which was being supported by the load balancer who then forwarded on to the appropriate server. Let's also imagine that on-prem that we're also doing some virtualization. So at our facility, we've got some virtual machines. We'll go ahead and draw a couple here. And of course, those virtual machines would be living inside, logically, inside of a hypervisor that's providing the environment for those VMs. We'll call that VM1 and VM2. And so within the same hypervisor, the same virtualization environment, we can network those guys together. We can bridge them out to the real world. We can integrate them with existing VLANs. And so you might be thinking, Keith, that's all well and good and wonderful, but what has this got to do with infrastructure as code? Well, the answer is there's a lot that can go wrong with rolling out a topology like this, including the load balancer, the virtual machines, the networking, the VLAN assignments, and everything else. Case in point, if they asked us to roll this out by hand and they gave us, like, say, two hours to do it, we could roll it out, it's very likely we'd have a mistake or two in the mix. Or let's say we did it perfect, and then they say the next day, okay, tear that all down, do it again. It's very likely it's not going to be identical to what it was the previous day. And what we want is we want consistency with how our network's configured. And also we wanna make sure it doesn't drift. So if there's some switches or VMs or VLANs that are configured, we wanna make sure that if change control wasn't followed, that there's no changes to those environments. And so the solution to consistently rolling out our environments and also checking for drift, and this applies to load balancers, firewalls, routers, switches, virtual machines, and more, is if we programmatically have scripts and routines that can build this for us, we don't have to do it manually. So in combination with software-defined networking and automation, we could roll out a new site that's effectively using a script or a set of scripts to deploy and configure and to verify. And in that script, in that automation, we'd have error handling. So if there was a result that came back that wasn't the same, or once we've deployed it, if we're checking on that deployment and we have one aspect that's changed, the automation side of that could identify, whoa, this parameter has changed or this host has changed and bring it to our attention, and that way we can maintain the consistency. And some common terms that are often associated with infrastructure as code would include automation, and also another common term I've often heard with infrastructure as code is orchestration, which is coordinating and rolling out the details and configurations and deployments without us having to manually implement those changes. And as an example of this, one of the amazing people I work with, his name is John, 
and he does a lot of labbing up of gear. And he has scripts that he uses, so basically he can just run a few scripts and take nothing <laughs> as far as his network model, nothing that was there, and then in a few minutes, boom, everything's there and discovered and ready to go, which is a great example of infrastructure as code. Scripts and commands that can be used to implement our configurations in a consistent way over time and also look for drift or changes and bring that to our attention as well. And when I first got involved with computers back in the 90s, uh, I was introduced to something called a batch file, which at the time I thought, what a wonderful thing, this batch file. And a batch file basically took task one, task two, task three, or application one, two, and three, and four, and it executed them. This one, then this one, then this one, then this one. And infrastructure as code is very similar to a batch file, doing this, then that, then the other. However, it's a lot more elaborate these days because we have some amazing automation tools and also some options about communicating with devices like switches and routers and firewalls through something called an API, an application programming interface. So with the right automation tool and using the right APIs, we can have a computer that's running the automation software, interacting with these network devices and pushing and verifying configurations as it goes. So thank you for joining me in this video regarding infrastructure as code. And in the next video, I'd like to take a closer look with you at demand-based resources with the concepts of elasticity and scalability. So I'll see you in just a few moments for that. Hey, thanks for watching and subscribe right here to get the latest information from CBT Nuggets. And if you're new to or considering a career in the world of IT, head on over to CBT Nuggets and sign up for a free trial.